Hey guys, these are my very top tips for finding gold with a dry washer. I guarantee that this will give you success. The first thing you want to do when you're setting these guys up is you're going to put the hopper face down. They're designed to fold open that way and then it's really easy to put these legs on. Keen put these cool little snaps on here so you don't got to worry about pushing those little spring loaded divots in there and then you can slide your bar in. And then when you're done, turn it like such and then the little lock slides on in such. Alright, well, I told you about these little snap locks and like I said, you got three holes there. I like to put mine in the first hole because it puts this classifier box here, this hopper, at a very steep angle. Makes that material run off really easy so you don't have to worry about scraping it. Instead of having those old push locks on these clips, they got spring loaded ones. So it's a whole lot easier just to get your hand in there. And you just hold it up and these little guys just clip right in. And then you just hook the chain up like you normally do until you get everything dialed in. Now I'm gonna take it out so you can get a good look at this. Everything about this is different. You got this polycarbonate plastic board on the back, see that? And you see how you got these machine squares here? They wanna create dead air zones behind these riffles, see that? If you put the light through there, you'll see that it blocks the air. And in the old days, if you remember, we had to put tape back here. That would stop the airflow and it would create a dead air zone behind these riffles so the fine gold wouldn't get blown out. And the reason why it's polycarbonate is because you've got another piece of polyester material in here. This creates static electricity when the air blows through it, see that? And when it creates static electricity, it transfers it to this polycarbonate board, which holds the static electricity. And it, what it does is it creates that really powerful 0.7 milliamp uh, static charge and it gets held in this polycarbonate board right here so it helps to hold the gold in this this new type of matting. Gold is affected by static electricity. The fine gold will actually stick to it. I know a lot of people are going to argue with me but it's true. Inside the box here you got this really super heavy duty counterweight. You see that? And the reason why it's so big is because you're going to have extra vibration. See these little tiny pens back here? What they do is they disperse the material so it comes across here evenly and it goes into the top of your riffle tray a lot more evenly so it doesn't beat up the riffle tray and it flows across it more evenly if you open up this butterfly and push up on this gate this acts like a throttle valve I can increase or decrease the amount of pressure inside of the box and by doing so I can reroute air out here which increases the spin or vibration on that fan these little guys on the side these are called bump stops how do they work well I got one on each side it holds this lower tray box in place and you're thinking Jeff if it does that how the heck is it gonna vibrate keen figured out if they put a bigger fan in there with a bigger counterweight increase the vibration and then put these bump stops here the vibration is transferred from the box to the hopper so the box is vibrating and so is the hopper like this and so by doing that you spend less time pushing that material down inside the hopper to get through that flow gate and then of course across the riffles if you're gonna run one of these guys you gotta have one of these guys <laughs> Invest in a good spoon. Some people like to use the shovel. I like using a spoon. The reason why is it's plastic and it ain't gonna mess up your uh, classifier screen here on your hopper. And it's easier to get the rocks out of there. Cause trust me, that thing's gonna fill up with rocks. It's gonna be hard to get it out. So I like using a spoon with my shovel. This is called a header pile right here. This is where all the rocks, they come out of that hopper after they're classified go, they won't fit through that screen. See how that? It's almost all to the top. Actually, it was touching just a minute ago. Well, if that's up underneath there, it's gonna stop that box from vibrating. And if that box don't vibrate, you ain't getting no gold. This is called a tailing pile. The front section, header pile, tailing pile. Another thing you gotta watch out for is you start running dirt through here, it's gonna pile up like this, see that? And it, what does it do? It rests against the box right there. You don't want that. You're gonna have to get in there and shovel that out with your spoon or your shovel, or if you got a helper to help you so shovel that out. Because if as long as this piles up here, it's gonna block the flow and it's gonna dampen the vibration on that box. You don't wanna do that. This is something that I think everybody should do. And if you don't, you're just throwing gold away. And that's a sin. <laughs> At the end of the day, you're gonna rake down. This is called your header pile right here. And you're gonna go over it. You gotta rake them out, go over it. Because I've seen so many people walk away and another guy come in with a VLF and get easy free nuggets. When you set up your dry washer, you gotta make sure that not only is it level from side to side, but it's also level forward to aft. You're going to want to make sure that this hopper right here is close to your diggings. I'm going to shovel it directly. Now some guys, they'll put it in a five gallon bucket and they'll bucket it in. And that's great because you can control the flow. You got two ways of controlling your flow. You got a flow gate 
right here got these two wing nuts on it and then you've got this chain here it goes to this spring which holds the end of the box up and these two things right here can affect your flow it's really important that you understand the type of material you're running because if you're running heavy black sands or moist material you want that material to settle in the box slower and go over the top of the riffles a lot slower so the gold has a chance to settle out and the way that you do that is you decrease your flow you can close this gate a little bit more or you can take the chain here take it off here and you can raise the box up higher like this. And what that does is it slows the material down. So gold has a chance to settle in behind those ripples. The blower motor, it's that Echo 210 leaf blower. Two stroke, they run forever. I like it because they generate plenty of CFM to run that dry washer. Now, if you notice, I got mine way over here on the side. That's important because you don't want any of that dust coming off that dry washer to get sucked back up into here. The rule of thumb is better to have too much air than not enough. Because if you don't get enough air flowing across those riffles, and through that matting, the material's gonna just hang right up and load up those riffles. You ain't gonna get no gold. So I usually run mine at full blast. Now you want something real flexible and you wanna make sure that it fits snugly over the end of that leaf blower. Now the problem is, is on these 140s, the outside diameter of the hose fitting is bigger than the fitting on this leaf blower. So I put an adapter down here that fits over the top of it. And that way the hose fits on there nice and snug. And I don't gotta mess with it. But you're going to want at least a good set of heavy duty gloves and of course you're going to want some type of a mask to wear because you don't want silicosis or any of that other nasty stuff that might be in that dirt. Now you can also wear hearing protection because that leaf blower after a while give you a headache. Some people like to wear long sleeves and of course you're going to want to have boots on and long pants because there might be critters in that ground. You see how it's sitting even in there? I got a little bit of a high side right there. You come over here, there's a little latch on the bottom of these Keen 140s. You should always bring a little brush. It makes cleaning the top of that tray off. And the reason why I like to do that is because when I pull out this riffle tray, I don't want any dirt to accidentally fall down in my box. Now, if that were the case, or if I got any dirt that got sucked up into that intake and ran through that tube, you have this little tiny port down here on the bottom. It's just got a little release. You open it like that, pull it out, you can tilt the box forward and then all the dirt will run out if you got any little dirt in there or rocks or pebbles. You're going to have to have a bucket. Don't lose this bucket. This is proprietary only for the cleanups, nothing else. You're just going to lift that up gently. See that? Just like that. And you're going to put him in like such. The riffles are facing that way. Don't do it the other way. Put it in like such. Tap it. Make sure everything's out of it. That's another reason I like to bring these brushes. See that? I can just brush that dirt right off the back. I don't like using my hand because I'm afraid I'm going to damage it. Put him da face down. Don't do this because he's going to pick up a bunch of dirt. There's my polyester matting. See that? It's got a little bit of rocks in there. Nothing to write home about. See all that dirt on the back? I can just paint brush him off. And then I got a little bit of dirt and dust in there. I can just kind of clean him out. And that way I got a nice good seal when I go to put that back in. See, I got a couple rocks up in there. And at all your dry washers, you're going to have to do this, okay? Piece of equipment you might want if you're going to be dry washing is this guy. It's the Falcon MD-20. Well, this thing can pinpoint tiny, tiny, tiny pieces of gold. And it picks up iron. What you do is you look for the different layers in the strata, in the rock, in the gravel. You're going to take this guy and you're going to go along and you're going to look for irons or even sometimes gold. Now, remember the trick to this thing is, is if you go forward and it sounds off, it's gold. If you pull away and it sounds off, it's iron. Remember, you wanna go to gold, you wanna go away from iron. And this will help tell you which layers have the most mineralization in them. And those are the layers you're gonna wanna dry wash. And that way you don't have to waste time digging all this other fluff out of the way and running it through your dry washer and spending all day doing nothing. So make panning so much easier, you classify your cons or your concentrates that you get out of that darn thing because it's gonna be a lot easier to pan. Remember the golden rule. If everything is the same size in the pan, then gold rules. Classify him out. I'll hold him later for nuggets. Now I got a lot of that limestone and a lot of that granite porphyry in there. That's what the gold's traveling in. I'll shake that down. Woo, look at that. Look at that, see that? Tap that up to the top. There's some nice pieces in there and there's some little tiny ones in there too, see that? Woo wee, that's not bad. I think we only ran for maybe what, 45 minutes? I'm gonna show you some more sampling in old mine dumps. I got some beautiful looking quartz mines tonight and some slate. Now remember I told you the three S's. Schist, 
Slate and shale. Now this is slate. It's a metamorphic rock and it can come from shale. And it's mostly from sedimentary rock that's been heated up. Now you can see where it's foliated, which means that it splits in these nice clean lines. And uh, a lot of times what will happen is the iron pyrite will form in here. And then when it oxidizes out, it leaves hematite, which is this red color. And of course the gold behind as well. And then you'll have silica and oxygen in the mix, which creates quartz. Here's another piece right here. You can see how nice and smooth that is. And like I said, the uh, iron pyrites will form here and then oxidize out and leaving the gold behind. So if you see this, especially if it's green in there, which you see some traces of green, and what that means is that there's chloride in there. Chloride is important because it gives you a chloride ion and that helps put gold into solution. And of course, if you have iron and manganese dioxide, that brings gold out of solution. I've got a big old pile just sitting here and we're gonna go through here and I'm gonna do a quick sample. I got about four or five scoops of dirt in there. And that's a good sample. We're running a number eight screen. I like number eight screen. You can see how that gets that nice and fine. We're gonna go ahead and pan that out. And yeah, you're gonna get wet. You can see all that hematite in there. All right, that's about as far down as I wanna get. I'll give that a good tap. Pan that out slowly for you. See if I got anything. Oh yeah, there's a nice little piece right there. I wanna get my jeweler's loop out so you can take a peek at that. that nice chunk right there, see that? Ooh, there's a couple nice little pieces right in there too. I like that. Heck yeah! <laughs> Woo -hoo 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 yeah! Now this ground is really wet underneath, about three or four inches down, so I could only run the top layer. I'm gonna dump concentrates directly into my pan. Now I know I should have classified it, but I didn't run that much material today, because it's too wet. So I'm gonna go ahead and pan this out real quick, see if we got anything. Okay. Woo wee! I know, I got a whole bunch of mud in my water. That's what I'm talking about right there, all along the top there. I don't know if you can see that. There's some pretty gold in there. I got you at a mine. I ain't gonna tell you where it's at. I know for a fact that the mine dumps have gold in them. I'm gonna show you how to sample them. So come here, take a look at this. When you're sampling mine dumps, what you're always gonna need to bring with you is a tub, about five gallons of water, a little stand, Coleman stand. I like to use this one. A 30 mesh screen, 20 mesh would do. A Garrett Super Sluice gold pan. I really love these things. A spoon or some kind of a shovel to dig with. Dust mask, gloves, jet dry. If you're gonna be sampling these old mine dumps, the gold's gonna be real fine and real small. It'll actually float on the surface, so get some jet dry to put in the water. Snuffer bottle. You gotta be able to suck that gold out when you're done. Um, we're gonna be using a dry washer today. And of course, I like to bring quarter screen because if I'm doing a real quick sample, I'll use this one. But for the most part, the 20 is better because gold's gonna be small. I can see I've got two different types of rocks. See how that one's really foliated and breaks apart easily? This one's not foliated. It looks almost like a granite. Over here, I've got a lot of green in there, which means chloride. Now, what I've noticed is, is this particular mine where the contact zones of these two rocks come together, there's a big quartz vein that runs right down the center. And there's calcite and quartz, and well, that's where the free mill gold was locked up. And so what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna sample out of here and see if there's any small pieces of gold that are trapped in this rock that I can dry wash out later. So what you do is you grab your trusty dusty spoon, grab a little bit of dirt, Shovel it in, screen, get a nice little sample of about 20 or 30 mesh, and then take it over to your water. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna gently pan that out, put some jet dry in that water, and that way it breaks the surface tension on the water. That way your fine gold doesn't wanna float. And it's better than dish soap because dish soap will funnel up real bad. You're gonna take your jeweler's loop and you're gonna get in there and see if you can see any fine traces of gold. Oh yeah, look at that. So what I'm gonna do is I'll set up a dry washer next to that. Now I also advocate that you sample all the other piles of dirt because gold can show up in the weirdest of places. We're gonna be using a different type of dry washer. Now I know in the past I used Keen 140 and I love those dry washers, but today we're using a Royal. I've heard a lot of good things about these Royals and I really like the way they're built. And there's a couple things different about this one than a Key 140s. All right, now the difference between the Royals and the Key 140s is that when you go to do a cleanup, there's just this one little locking tab down here. You pull up on it. The riffles don't come out. See, they're bolted in there. They just kind of swivel up. And then remember your paintbrush? All you gotta do is take that and just brush out your cons. If you're like me and you wanna get every speck, you're gonna pull that whole thing out like such. Now, another thing I wanna talk about on these Royals is the fan and the counterweight in here are a lot bigger than on the Key 140s. And because of that, this box will actually oscillate a heck of a lot more. And so you don't even have to run your Echo 210 on full speed. You can run it on half. I've seen guys run it on idle and it still does really well. All 
right, so I'm gonna do a cleanup. I'm gonna get my bucket ready because I don't wanna lose my concentrates. All right, now all I'm gonna do is just gently clean my concentrates right in my bucket like that. Being ever so gentle. I'm gonna clean the sides of that box off. That way there's no dirt there preventing me from getting an airtight seal. I didn't go over the settings of this, so I'm gonna do that real quick. So come here, take a look at this. You have three little holes. One, two, and three. Now I got mine in the middle. That's the uh, normal setting. Uh, you've got the other one, which is a steeper setting for like uh, dirt clods, and then you've got the lower setting for moist dirt. Uh, the next thing would be, of course, is the feed gate here. I've got mine in the, the medium position based on the type of soil I'm running. If you're running moist soil or big clogs or what have you, you're gonna wanna open that up. If you're running fine sand, you're gonna close that up. So that way you don't have a, you're not over filling this riffle box. On my settings for my angle on my box, I usually like to give it somewhere between 30 degrees, maybe 35, uh, based on soil conditions. Uh, when you get a, used to using these boxes, you'll start to get a feel for how much material should flow over those riffles if you're going too fast or too slow. If you want to check to see if you're going too fast, all you got to do is sample your uh, tailing pile down here. And if there's any gold in it, of course, you know that it's going too fast. So. We sample pan the area, of course, to start with. And we found some of this really nice, heavy iron oxide uh, just sitting up here uh, on this uh, old mine dump. And so what we're doing is we're running through the dry washer, trying to get some gold out of here because we did find some when we sample pan, so we know there's something in there. Based on the geology of this area, you got two contact zones. The primary contact zone is the limestone and the granite where they come together. In between is this iron oxide, heavy iron oxide. What we're doing is we're trying to dry wash it all out of here, recover the gold. We're gonna do cleanup in about an hour or so. Want gold? You gotta earn it. Okay, here's the cleanup. See if I can get that in there for you. There you go, not too shabby. Got some nice pieces in there. Not too shabby. I'll take it. All right. Not too bad. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Got me a claim jumper. Come get some, boy. <laughs> Go get some, boy! <laughs> oh. I don't think that's a claim jumper, chump. <laughs>